Good morning. It's always uh, a challenge to come to a forum like this to speak with Africans about Africa. You know, like you live in Africa, I live over here. I'm the man in the bleachers who look at this hockey game and says, why didn't you pass the ball to the guy? And of course, you didn't see the guy who was next to you. Uh, so the advantage of being outside allows us kind of to have the bigger view of what's happening on the continent in ways uh, some of you don't always have the privilege to do it. So when you are playing the game, you are busy on the game. You're not busy looking at the, the entire pitch. So it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and welcome to Washington, D.C. Um, we were asked to speak about uh, these conflict trends, and uh, Paul has done a fantastic job in kind of framing the issues. I'd like to talk a little more about the drivers and dynamics that affect us or promote conflict or cause conflict. Uh, Africa is often seen and looked at as an isolated place. It's, it's Mars, it's not part of the world. But Africa is part of the world, very much the center of the world. Right? And so everything that we'll be talking about happened within a global context. Imagine being elected or appointed president in 1960 for your country. Um, you are confronted with a number of issues right from the outset. One is the colonial to independence transition. One is state building, nation building, managing diversity in your own country. Your citizenship, what does it mean to be a citizen? Because in a lot of countries, as member of as societies and colonies, you are not citizens of any other country, you are a colony. The colonies, are the colonies administration or colonial administrations were repressive administrations. They were not democratic administration. Um, and then we had to deal with the distribution, equitable distribution of your resources. And all this while having never experienced any reference to a state. So Africa is thrust into this system, this global system, which by the way created all the states that we have. What was coming out of Africa during that independence movement, which I will contend went from the 50s, you know, starting with India in 49, and Ghana in Tunisia and the other countries, and going all the way to 2011 with South Sudan. So even when we look at the independence movement, we should not restrict it to the 60s or the 50s. That issue is still with us, Eritrea. That's independence issues. So. A lot of the country went with two different phases of those issues. Some countries went through it in the 50s and the 60s. Some of them are still going through it now. Um, so how do you deal with that stuff? So within that context of shifting uh, global dynamics, you know, the emergence of about 40 African countries in the 60s and the 70s shifted the dynamics in the UN. All of a sudden, there was a new block that did not exist before. And that block was courted and, of course, sometimes coerced into doing part or doing part of a, a larger um, system that they were not particularly interested in, right? i.e., the Cold War. Very quickly, these countries had to be sucked into those dynamics with consequences for their own management in the country. Whether you choose to be on the right, on the left, on the spectrum, it affected what happened internally. Um, the other trend was, even right off the bat again, not just the Cold War, even the Arab-Israeli war quickly was visited on the Africans because they had to choose side. So there are all these dynamics that are not always purely Africans, that Africans have to contend with. So within that context of building a, a new nation, uh, quickly we saw the rise of a one-party system. And the rise of one party system, I don't think people were thinking, I'm going to oppress my people, I'm going to be a dictator. People were thinking, I'm going to build a nation. And you guys from the north here, be quiet, just come along. And the guys from the north are contesting your legitimacy because they're saying, Who are you? The British just left. We used to be independent. Why are you imposing on us this? So quickly, you have either to use patronage to calm some people down, maybe the paramount chief in the south. Or you use the big stick and the gun, the state apparatus, which, by the way, was based on the colonial system. When one region wanted more autonomy, the colonial sent troops. They didn't sit with them and negotiate. 
So it's a model that a lot of our countries in Africa adopted quite early. Of course, the result was that it created a vicious cycle. The very issues were not resolved. It kind of uh, swept under the rug. Um, of course, the rise of uh, this very strong authoritarian regime, which were one-party system, often were, quickly led to proliferation of armed conflict, whether it was cross borders or whether it was within the country itself. So we saw a number of wars uh, from the Ogaden, from the Shabas, Angola, and others. And those were very much affected by both global dynamics and internal dynamics. And they totally kind of killed the social contract. And that mismanagement led us to another larger trend, uh, which was the international financial institution involvement in those countries, structural adjustment programs. This was supposed to help African countries because, well, because of the issue I just mentioned, there was mismanagement of resources for different sets of reasons. Sometimes it was because there were economic and financial shocks from outside, sometimes because there were mismanagement of resources inside. But the result was that the IMF and others showed up in Africa and say, we're going to help you with structural adjustment. So just tighten your belt. And the result was, of course, in trying to help with the public expenditure and put transparency, transparency in the structure, it, it actually killed a lot of institutions. Right? Privatization was not good for Africa. A lot of countries, especially those with rich resources, like Zambia, DRC, some of the problems were created from that time. Yeah. There was an elite that benefited, the elite that was most vocal in embracing structural adjustment and privatization. Um, those guys were loved by those institutions. They were not loved by the people because jobs were killed. The people who came to privatize and take uh, those companies were not local. They were typically outside operators who did not have the same strategic and national interest in those countries. So all of a sudden, in places like DRC and Zambia, big mining concerns collapsed, and you have the proliferation of the emergence of artisanal mining. Artisanal mining are not going to lift the economy. All of a sudden, the operators who come from outside wanted to pay under the table did not want to pay the taxes and the royalties as he was subjected. So we're still struggling with those issues in most of our countries. We have more problem with, um, what do you call it, power shedding, load shedding, electricity, which we had less of in those early days, because of course the companies have been privatized. There is no accountability in any meaningful way. So this is just kind of to give us a little bit of a sense of wh where we came from. So now to the main trends that I made, I'm going to talk about five of them that are driving some of the conflict that we're facing today. One is democratization and what I call the manipulation of democratic institution. Right? So following the Berlin, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, there was a wave of democratization across the continent. This is when the likes of Laurent Babo, uh, Moe Kibaki, Etienne um, Tshisekedi in the RC, and others emerged because the entire world, this was another global dynamics that were causing friction, again, not just in Africa, in Romania, in other places. So Africa went through a wave of this. Some countries did well. Uh, countries like Benin had a transition, a soft landing, if you will, from dictatorship to a form of democracy. Countries like Zambia, other countries resisted. Those countries that resisted had war, eventually. Congo Brazzaville, Remember the ninjas and the cobras? Uh, Congo DRC, it took a while. Rwanda, part of the genocide, one of the causes of genocide was both that friction of the democratization, they were talking about Russia Accord, who should get what, and also structural adjustment. Rwanda was not poorly mismanaged, was not poorly managed like the other African countries, but it was treated as such. With the change in commodity prices, and other dynamics on the financial markets, Rwanda was affected heavily, and that exacerbated some of the discussions that were taking place. It created that narrative of the Tutsi coffee brokers being manipulative of the price, when in fact it was beyond Rwanda. So, you know, some of these programs treat all nations like cookie cutters. These are bad nations, we treat them alike. No, bad nations are not, all nations are not created equal. Corruption in DRC, corruption in Nigeria, by the way, I don't like that term because when you say corruption, you don't typically know what you're talking about. 
Are you talking about embezzlement? Are you talking about the cop who asked for money? Or the uh, uh, immigration agent, last time when I was in Nigeria, after she handed me my passport and my visa, she smiled and she said, welcome, tip, please. You know, so is that corruption or somebody is trying to supplement dietary, you know, capabilities at home? I don't know, but that's not, you cannot just put everything in the same basket, which is often what we do when we engage with Africa, right? So democratization was very much alive and the frictions made it that those who resisted typically eventually led to war. So this is what Paul was just talking about, politics eventually affect a lot. If Mobutu had just accepted the will of the people and stepped down, chances are DRC will not have experienced the war that came in 96. Right? Um, we, we, we're seeing something similar in a couple of countries. So democratization overall, starting in the late 90s, in the mid 90s, has hold. It, it's held, it, it has uh, held the course so far. Uh, we see that people do not want one party system across the continent. In fact, uh, an Afrobarometer poll conducting 34 African countries shows that 68% of Africans want to live in democratic societies, even though that number itself is down from 72% in 2012. So we've had about a slide, a slide uh, in a little bit. We also see that elections are more frequently held. They're driven by continued popular pressures and donors demand for democratization. So we see this in Chad, we see this in DRC, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, Gabon. These countries have, they have elections. The challenge is more and more these elections tend to meet the legal threshold, but they do not confer legitimacy. So in other words, countries go through the motion of elections to calm the population or to calm the donors. But it's the form and the substance is very problematic. So many of these elections meet the bare minimum of voter expectations and fall short, way, way short. We also see that alongside there's another friction that is showing up, is the other side of the people who are not as interested in democratization. So we see um, autocratic tendencies are on the rise in a number of countries. Ruling parties capture state institutions, including the courts, electoral commissions, to serve their own purposes. So you want you, you went to the elections, you have grievances, you go to the court. Of course, you, what do you expect when you go to the court? We see also that over the last uh, five years, there's been an overall deterioration of the quality of political transformation and governance across the continent. So today, between the tension between democratic aspirations and resurgence of autocratic preferences of ruling parties is most apparent. Among the 54 countries, we have about 15 deficient democracies and 16 hardline autocracies. So right there, you can see the, the, the fault line. So what does this mean? In terms of positive outlook, just because we have drivers of conflict or friction doesn't mean we have to have armed conflict. Democracy is conflict. It just doesn't have to turn into armed conflict. You see, you see coverage of the parliament in South Korea where you see MPs going at each other, Manu, you know, Manu to Manu throwing shoes at each other. Uh, they don't take weapons, they, 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 they do tussle in the, in the hemicycle. So the gains here, the positive is that the majority of Africans want to live in political open spaces and democratic society. So there's no going back in that. But the challenge is that we have to confront and defeat authoritarianism because the result that has not worked for Africa. We've been there before. The other friction, uh, point of friction and uh, change of dynamics here is migration and youth bulge. So nearly 50% of the population in Africa is under 18. So this creates tremendous demographic pressures on Africa. UNICEF estimated that at least 580 million of Africans are under 18. And this segment, just this segment, the youth segment is four, time larger, four times larger than uh, uh, the counterpart in Europe. And it accounts for 25% of the world's children across the spectrum. By 2055, Africa will, become home, will be home to 1 billion children, and which will be 40% of the children of the world, the children of the world. So just to get, what does this mean then? So positively, in the long run, 
Uh, these youth bonds represent uh, unlimited and untapped potential for economic development and renewal of human development and leadership. It's the future, right there. The challenge is that, uh, in the short run, however, democratic pressure exacerbates governance challenges and it's overwhelm public services. If not adequately managed, then the population growth will cause more instability. We don't know what the youth will do if when they don't have opportunities. They can go either way. So consequently, Africa is experiencing a rise in public discontent, political contestation, and repression. So we see this from Senegal to Burkina Faso to DRC, where youth have demanded change, and they want to be at the table. Some countries are doing better with this, some other countries has that structural, cultural structural challenge, which I call it, where the elders do not give respect to the youth. It depends on where country you are. I've seen countries where a elder will not even talk to the youth. Even the youth has to struggle to frame what they're trying to say. So in the end, they're not communicating because the youth is not saying what they really want to say because they're afraid to be disrespectful. And that culture stuff has a lot of implication in the way that we run our countries. If people cannot speak, here we call the elders by their first name, in the West, that is. Yeah. I remember as a young student finishing high school in DRC and going to Norway and sitting in a math class, and one of the students, and the, the math teacher was actually the president of the school, and one of the students goes, do, Einstein, he says, you, Einstein, asking the question. And I'm like, why? She just called him by his first name and said, you. But you see what that means. That means the communication goes a long way when people can speak freely. So that's something that actually is very problematic for us in Africa. We see that from Kenya to Nigeria to Liberia, Africans have embraced their constitutions. The ruling part is that to tamper with the constitution, to do that kind of motion, go through the legal motion. But the youth are saying, we don't want any of that. So again, we're going to the street, they're going to the street asking for the constitution to be respected on as the fundamental uh, law of the land. We see youth groups emerge, Yanamar for our friends from Senegal, Bale Citoyen Burkina Faso, Lucha in DRC. All these youth groups have put so much pressure on the regime that there is no way to avoid them. Uh, we also see mobilization of youth in Zimbabwe, in Tunisia, in Algeria, of course, in South Sudan, and in Sudan. South Africa, roads must fall. That's not going to go away. We'll see these things in different forms as we move forward. So what do states do then? Instead of listening to the youth, the state re revert to violence. By resorting to violence, the grievances are not resolved. We see, we see cycles, university cycle where students take seven years to finish a four-year degree. Because every time they protest, the, student, the government calls down the government, uh, the university, instead of addressing the issue. They send the police. Of course, the police commit the, the violence that we know. Then the cycle goes on and on. We also see that uh, urbanization and migration becomes a serious problem. Failure to deliver services, especially in the rural areas, attract everybody in the city. Uh, and of course, in the city, the system is overwhelmed. Then uh, we go in cycle again. The result has been a rise of what we call the mega cities of the future, so right? at least Four or five of the mega cities will be in Africa. Cairo, 19.5 million people. Lagos, 23 million people. Kinshasa, 11 million people. Joburg, 8. Nairobi, 6.5. What is the future of these this, uh, entities, these mega cities? Can we manage them? Is that the way to go? Most people in the West in the developed nation live outside the city. They live in rural area, they live in the villages, but they have access to the amenities. Here's where states are struggling in, on the continent. Migration then leads, of course, to brain drain. Right? I'm here because of brain drain. So, so migration leads to that. Uh, failure of governance in initiatives eventually tell young people that, well, there's no really opportunities for you, go elsewhere. So we have migration within Africa and migration outside. So just to give you a sense, from 2015 to 2017, migration within Africa increased from, 19, uh, from 16 million to 19 million within Africa. That's just in two years, we have three million more. And then migration outside Africa, uh, 
increased slightly from 16 to 17 million. So we see that we're losing a lot of our people. But that is not always negative. Um, so on the, on the positive side, migration can invigorate growth, uh, growth. It can bridge labor shortages and market gaps. And it can uh, provide opportunities for creativity. The challenge is that talent flight eventually robs the states of human resources that they need to address the very issues that they're fleeing from. Right? Uh, migration within African countries can cause rises in violent xenophobia. We see this a lot in South Africa. Uh, that's kind of the extreme of that, but we see various forms of it in different parts of Africa. Um, and this, of course, this goes, the cycle goes on because that migration within different countries eventually exacerbates governance issues in that specific countries. Right. We see a lot of IDPs. Yeah? The other issue that comes in, we have a, a different set of conflict which creates a humanitarian crisis. So here we just see that the state not upholding the social contract then leads to more armed conflict. Paul discussed those a little bit. And we see that this type of conflict affects all regions of the continent, right? From Libya all the way to Zimbabwe, to Eastern Congo, to CAR, very much present. So here, uh, what we see, what the arise is the confluence of bad governance and lack of political will. You know, so we see rebellion in Mali, Central African. We see an increased numbers, increased numbers in internal displaced persons, and that of course puts pressure in the communities that host them. It strains the state and it strains the donors. Even the donors don't have unlimited resources because they're dealing with their own issue. So eventually, these communities are left to to fend for themselves. Natural resources, Paul uh, talked a lot about it, but I want to, to address one thing, it's opaque privatization deals. Uh, feed illicit financial flows that cost the continent a lot. Just to give you an example, in the case of DRC, DRC is, is wealthy, underground, yeah. underground, but not in the bank, not in the way that. So a lot of deals were made so that at the end, the Kofi Annan Foundation estimated that about $15 billion disappears from Congo in the, this kind of deals. $15 billion a year. The budget of the DRC is about $8 billion, the official budget. That less money than some universities have. <coughs> but this is not because Africans cannot manage. It's because there's an elite, the political group of people who capture the state. And the result, of course, we cannot fund our schools. We cannot fund our hospitals. Um, we see this affecting, becoming more pronounced when climate change affects. The repeated cyclones in Mozambique. Mozambique just went to a bout of a lot of issues with the fiscalities there and how they manage the resources of the new, uh, the money they're getting from the new resources, gas especially and others. So how can we have this problem recurrent all the time but there's actually money in the country or that leaves to go to Panama? Right. Uh, so. This is a problem across the board. Penury of resources cause intercommunal tensions again. How do you share the little that you have? We see this specifically in places like Sahel where you have the trends between herdsmen and, and, um, and farmers. You know, I was in Nigeria a couple months ago and drove from Kano to Abuja and we went through an area where the, the guide showed me this is where the, the herdsmen come. But they come all the way from Guinea to come to Nigeria, and some of them end up in northern Congo, what they call the Mbororo. That's how much of a crisis this is. How do you manage those? Public health and pandemics become becoming more and more pronounced. We saw the Ebola crisis in Liberia. We saw the Ebola crisis in DRC. Both countries have the potential to take care of this themselves. But that did not happen because, again, resources have been squandered, illicit financial flows do not help those countries. So these are one kind of two frames. So to go back, some of these drivers are um, issues that can be resolved. The one other thing I wanted to add is uh, technological advances. The internet has changed everything. Kids in Lusaka, kids in Zimbabwe, know more about America than I do. They know more about what's happening in South Korea because they're online. Africa has tremendous potential in that stuff. It has one of the largest penetration rates of mobile. 
So the technology has allowed Africa to leapfrog um, if infrastructure investment, costly infrastructure investment in technology. What has not technology not allowed us is that we cannot leapfrog the fundamentals of governance. We cannot leapfrog social contract to stability. We still have to do the fundamentals of this. And technology has done two things. It allows the youth to mobilize. It's also allowed the uh, middle class that is expanding in Africa to demand, to demand more changes. So on the positive side, what we see is that both the youth are pushing for change, and we see the, um, the middle class who have some power, uh, purchasing power, demand changes. So we start seeing things in Africa like the Continental Free Trade Agreement. They want to be tapped into all the other resources that are around the world. How the government and state manage that will determine also where we go. But it also it has uh, some challenges. And one of the challenges like the state fears. And when the state fear want to crack down on this, and when it crack down again, I said earlier, it created the, the, the vicious circle cycle of, of violence in different forms. Finally, another area that's where we have a challenge is the new rush for Africa. Yeah? So who's coming to Africa? There's a new contestation of Africa, which we need to pay attention to. It's not different from what happened with Vasco da Gama and Diego Cao and everybody else. So everybody is laying claim on different portion of Africa. And that has tremendous potential. So we, of course, we're very familiar with China, $60 billion investment pledge across the continent. We know how those deals are affecting Africa, falling into some of the issues that I'd mentioned earlier. Um, putting a lot of strain in, in governance and um, really denying Africans access to resources, especially for the future. This goes from land, you know, land grab. Would the youth of Africa be able to afford land 30 years from now when all that land will be owned by foreign countries? So there is room for opportunities here. Maybe it's time for African states and countries and civil society to demand reforms of land, land reform. How, you know, property rights, who owns what when? That's very important because not owning land will be an issue. South Africa, of course, is still struggling. You can just talk to Julius Malema and you'll get the picture. And that issue is not going to be resolved if we don't go to the table and fix it. But China is not alone. So we see um, Russia, is playing, Russia is back. They're playing tremendous role in CAR where the national security advisor to the president is Russian, a fellow named by the name of Valery Zakharov. Right? The Gulf states and Saudi Arabia are very present in a lot of countries, sometimes in a very soft way, sometimes in a very frontal assault kind of way, very present, obviously, in the debate now in Sudan. Um, we see Turkey taking claims in different places. Turkish airline is very present across the continent. We have. Uh, a lot of uh, Turkish international schools across the continent now. Of course, Turkey is the only country that, or the first country, I think, I don't know if there have been another, that opened an embassy in Somalia. Yeah. China has a base in Djibouti. The US has a base in Djibouti. The French have a base in Djibouti. Japan has a military presence in Djibouti. India is flexing its muscle mostly financially to the Export-Import Bank. Israel is back, trying to strengthen its commercial ties, but also expand its uh, security interests there. Again, these are not all negative, but there is room there. In this case, I don't know what the positives are necessarily, because it's putting a lot of pressure on the African. But on the negative, there's a challenge here that uh, this rush, this new rush for Africa and its resources, may lead to conflict sometime. We'll see what happens. It may be directly between these powers that are coming to Africa or by proxy. The jury is out, time will tell how that pans out. So this, in a sense, is my take on uh, some of the drivers of conflict that we face. And we'll take more of those uh, during our Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention.